To almost anyone, this looks like a fairly normal piece of mail. Inside, you find a lovely request from the Prince of Zamunda, saying that you've inherited vast wealth, if only you provide to them your various details. Clearly, this is just a piece of junk mail, right? Well, not exactly. There are actually several secret messages hidden here. And no, I don't mean that there's some code mixed into the text. The text is 100% normal. The message is just so tiny that even looking right at it, you wouldn't see it, unless you knew it was there in advance. Here, watch this. This is where our first secret message is hidden, and even if I circle it, you still can't see it. But if I use some scissors to cut this little section out and then float the piece of paper in a little bit of water, you'll see the message start to reveal itself. The paper will swell and sink, but a tiny little black dot of material remains. Let's take this little chunk and stick it under the microscope. When we do, and zoom in, suddenly we see our first secret message. This is called a micro dot. It's a piece of spy technology that has actually been in use for more than 100 years, and was used extensively during the Cold War. Instead of a microscope, a spy would carry with them a special tiny lens for viewing microdots, so that any communication they received could be viewed. Then, at some point, they would be sent material that seems inert. A magazine, a letter, maybe a piece of clothing or a hat. Just like our piece of junk mail. And somewhere in that material, one or more microdots would be hidden, and they would be told in advance where to look. Then they need only extract it, view it, and then either hide the dot or dispose of it. And to anyone else, unless they knew exactly where to look, they would never find the message, making it incredibly secure. And this worked in reverse, too. Spies would be given special cameras that could take pictures of classified documents and convert them to microdots that could be sent back to their handlers. These tiny cameras could be small enough to fit in a matchbox or even be disguised as a pen. With the advent of the internet, I think we've maybe gotten a little bit too comfortable with the ease at which we can share and save information, especially encrypted information that no one snooping could decipher. But for a spy during the Cold War, passing information was not only a lot harder, a mistake often meant it would cost your life. And everything you touch or bring home can and probably would get picked over by counterintelligence services, either before you get it or while you're not home. Microdots were one of the ways this problem was addressed. They could be hidden in plain sight, like the example you just saw, but you don't necessarily need to hide the dots on the page. Here's a few hidden under the stamp, for example. Or it could be a laminated postcard with dots embedded in the core of the paper, and you need to pry it apart to get at the dots. The examples were pretty much endless and limited only by creativity. The beauty of microdots is that you can cram an insane amount of information into a tiny space without the need for any electronics. So during the First World War, carrier pigeons would be loaded with microdots, because that way you could pack more information into the carrying tube of the bird. And during the Second World War as well, they were used for secure communications and espionage, though I think with fewer pigeons. So, how do you make a microdot? Well, it turns out it's both easier than you might think, and yet also harder in other ways if you don't know some of the tricks. Today we're going to go through the whole process, and unlike most of the other projects we've done lately, this is absolutely one you can try yourself, and it's honestly really fun. Though, if you're younger, you're going to need your parents' supervision, as it does involve using some simple chemical solutions. If you're a child of the 90s or older, you've almost certainly, at some point, held the material used to make a microdot. And it's this stuff. Film negatives. When you take a picture with old school film, you are essentially taking a room-sized image and shrinking it down to 35 millimeters. Thing is, this ability to take an image and shrink it down was noticed literally since photography was first invented. Even daguerreotypes, which are one of the oldest types of photo that were taken on polished sheets of silver metal, had people using lenses to project tiny images onto the plates to make tiny little pictures. In fact, if you've ever spent any time in a reference library, you might have had a chance to handle this stuff, which is called microfiche. It's basically just photographic film, but instead of taking images of a pretty sunset, you find everything from copies of old newspapers, to manuals of obscure machines, and pretty much any reference material you can think of. Microfiche is incredibly stable, and because of how tiny everything is, it's also incredibly information dense. Before the advent of computers and the internet, microfiche was a way to store an immense amount of data in almost every library. Let me show you just how good a standard piece of film is. This is the USAF resolution test pattern. You can see that it gets smaller in increments and is the perfect pattern for testing things like this. I printed it out on a normal piece of paper and set it up on a wall in a very well-lit area on a white background. 
To actually shoot this, I'm using an old Nikon EM SLR 35mm camera. You don't need this model. We just happened to find this beauty on Facebook Marketplace for like 80 bucks, which was an absolute steal. And needing to buy it for this project has 100% started a film addiction I fully intend on enjoying once I'm done editing this video. Anyway, I started by loading up a roll of film and got set up to take the picture. Now, one downside to this process is that unlike a modern digital camera, the only way you know if your pictures look right is to develop them, which means using a whole roll of film each time to test your development settings and camera settings. I ruined a lot of film, both in the photo taking part of this project and the development steps we'll get to later. I also ruined film in many different exciting ways, including forgetting to engage various parts of the camera or loading the film incorrectly as I was learning how to do everything. So be prepared to do this a bunch of times if you're new to this. But film is cheap and the whole process is super fun, so stick with it till you get it. Anyway, I'm going to skip all the other photos I took for now and the development process, and let's just have a look at the resolution test pattern. Here it is under the microscope, and to give you a sense of scale, here is a quarter sitting next to the image. You can see, though, that as we get to the smaller details, we start to see a sort of blurring effect because of something called grain. When I move the film a little bit, you can see the grain is an intrinsic part of the image. The reason for this grain is because of how this film works. The photosensitive material in normal 35mm film is a special silver-based salt, usually silver chloride or iodide. When a crystal of these silver chemicals are exposed to light, the halide ion pops off and the crystal is reduced to tiny grains of metallic silver. Then in the development process, those grains are turned black. This means that the detail you can capture is directly related to how tiny the grains in your film are. In general, the higher or larger the ISO rating number, the larger the grains, because a big grain will react faster than a small one, but you lose more and more resolution as you increase the grain size. This is why I've been using ISO 50 film for these experiments, but if you're a spy, this is not an acceptable limitation. When every letter needs to be perfect and you want the dots to be as small as possible, you can't get stuck being limited by silver crystals. So most spy agencies had special film made that didn't use silver as the main ingredient. Instead, they used photosensitive organic polymers, which are perfectly smooth films of sensitive material that have no grain structure. This is actually very similar to the sorts of materials used in the manufacture of computer chips. In order to make computer chips or PCBs, you use something called photoresist. Basically, you shine your pattern onto the photoresist, and wherever the light hits it, it becomes chemically resistant and solid. So that way, when you develop the resist, all the stuff that didn't get hit with light washes away, exposing the bare metal or silicone below. In all likelihood, the CIA probably worked with a company like Kodak to develop special rolls of film with a photoresist-like material instead of silver so they could load all their special spy cameras and send messages to their agents. Though what they used or who they worked with to develop it, I have no idea. There are actually some commercial products that are probably close, like this mini copy film from Fujifilm, which is ISO 6. Beyond the grain structure, we're also running into issues of optical quality. While this camera is great, it's not exactly spy grade, so the optics aren't doing us any favors. The stuff used by spy agencies would only be the best of the best if they expected it to work properly and make truly tiny dots. We're here because you're looking for the best of the best of the best, sir. Thing is, you don't need to be a spy to care about the security of your communications. In our modern world of digital communication, it's actually easier than ever to spy on your activity. Every time you use the internet, you leave a very loud trail that all sorts of ne'er-do-wells and nosy organizations can keep track of. And sometimes, parts of the internet get locked behind a geolocation wall, where you can't access content because you happen to be standing on the wrong spot on Earth at the time. Enter the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. You can think of a VPN sort of like the carrier pigeons of old. It takes the message you want to send and securely moves it to another location before it is read so no one snooping knows where the message is going or what's inside. All you have to do is install their super easy to use app and press go, or choose from one of their many servers all around the world. The way this works is on your end, you just use the internet like normal. But instead of directly connecting to whatever website you actually want, the app encrypts and routes your traffic first through Nord servers before sending it on to wherever it needs to go. This way, anyone snooping can't tell what you're actually connecting to as all they can see is your connection to Nord. And if you ever get stuck on geo-locked content, you can just pick a server in that country so the site doesn't know that you're actually far away. 
So if you'd like to upgrade your internet security and make sure that no one snooping can see what you're up to, head to nordvpn.com slash Thought Emporium today. For the incredibly low price of only $3.33 per month when you sign up for their two-year plan, you also get an extra four months free. Try it risk-free for 30 days or your money back. Just follow the link in the description or go to nordvpn.com slash Thought Emporium to snag this amazing deal. All right, that's enough yammering. Let's make some microdots. Since the film negative is going to be the microdot, if you want black text on the final microdot, we need white letters on a black background to take a picture of. And since we're using normal film, there will be a limit to how small we can make things. While I was racking my brain to think of what it'd be fun to shrink down, I figured out that if you take the Dr. Seuss book, The Lorax, and remove all the pictures, it works out to approximately three or four pages. So I made a few images in Photoshop of the text on a black background and then printed them out. To maximize the contrast, I used one of our soft boxes as a backlight and then put the printed pattern on top. I used the maximum aperture and took pictures at different distances, making sure to get the focus as perfect as physically possible. And for comparison, I also took some images where the paper was just very well lit from the front to see if that made a difference. Now, there's space for 36 images on a roll of film, and after using about half the roll on microdot things, I switched to some more interesting images. Through this whole video, longtime viewers have probably been wondering, Justin, this is cool and all, but where are the horrors? You haven't turned anything into meat, or made an inanimate object sentient, or shown the rules of the universe being bent in a funny way. Why are you really interested in this? Well, dear viewer, the answer is of course because there is 100% an ulterior motive to pursuing this project. This ability to shrink down patterns is really handy, not just for information storage, but also for making special optical elements. Here, let me show you. This is literally just a printed picture of a pattern of lines, which at this scale has no special properties. But when we shrink it down using this camera technique, suddenly that pattern of lines gains special abilities. Now it's become a diffraction grating. If I put it in front of a point source of white light and look through it with a camera, you can see it now takes a spot of light and splits it into a rainbow. And this isn't just a quirk of developed film. A blank piece doesn't do this, and one of our regular patterns doesn't do this either. It has to be the very specific diffraction grading pattern. I'm not going to get into this part of the project much more today, but while I was shooting the microdots, I've also been calibrating various other patterns. Some will behave like lenses, some should form holograms, or twist and bend light into incredibly weird ways. In the next video that'll be out in a couple of weeks, we're going to be doing a deep dive into these effects, and all the myriad of ways you can mess with light by just shining it through the right pattern. But before I could do that, I needed to get the development process perfect, so we can turn the fresh negatives into either the final patterns or microdots. To do that, we need a few things. I'm using these auto feeder reels and this development tank, and to get the film safely out of the canister and loaded into the tank, I'm using this cheap darkroom bag. This isn't necessary, you can just do the loading in a pitch black room, but this bag is nice if you don't have a room in your house that is dark enough. Basically, you load your development tank, your film, and something to open the canister into the bag. Then you zip it up and Velcro it shut to make it light tight. Then you stick your arms through the holes and you can now safely work with the film without exposing it to light. To see what I'm doing in the bag, here's the same motions using a spent piece of film. Basically, you carefully slide the first bit of film onto the reel, and then when it's stable and you're sure it hasn't gotten crunched or cross-threaded, you start twisting the sides of the reel back and forth, and it automatically feeds the film onto the reel. When that's done, you put the reels back in the development tank and lock it shut. For the chemicals to develop the film, I tested a few different ones and settled on Blazonal as the developer and the Stop and Fixer from Ilford. Each of these need to be diluted to the correct ratio that is listed on the bottles, and you're going to need about 500 mils of liquid for each. I'm using these handy lab bottles because they have graduations on them making it easy to measure, and some graduated cylinders for precise measurements of small amounts of liquid. The most important measurement is the developer, and I found 25 milliliters of developer and 500 mils of water worked best. The other two, I just used what it said on the bottle. Once the solutions were mixed up, all you need is a timer and you're basically ready to go. Though, as you can see, I'm wearing gloves for this whole process and I highly recommend you do the same. I see a lot of people developing film without this and I honestly am baffled. Okay, for the developer steps, my cycle looks like this. For the first minute, constant agitation by capping the tank and inverting it back and forth. Then, for the next 11 or 12 minutes, each minute the tank is inverted a few times and then left alone for another minute. When the time is up, dump out the developer into a waste beaker or other container. 
I'm unsure if the developer can be reused multiple times, so feel free to let us know in the comments if you're more experienced with this. After the developer, we add the stop bath, which as the name implies, stops the reaction. 30 seconds to a minute with gentle agitation is plenty, and this solution can be reused, so dump it out and save it for later. Finally, the fixer cycle is three minutes, with constant agitation for the first minute and then occasional agitation for the rest of the time. After that, the fixer can be dumped and saved, and the film is ready to be washed. Under the sink, fill and empty the tank with lots of inversions and water changes. I do at least 10 water changes to make sure the film is nice and clean and free from any of the development chemicals. But then it's ready to come out. The film needs to be taken off the roll, squeegeed to remove excess water, and then hung up to dry before it can be used further. But once it's dry, you're basically done. All that's left is to very carefully cut out your micro dots, and you're finished. So how'd the Lorax turn out? Well, at the smallest size, I started to lose resolution, and a lot of the text was basically unreadable. But the slightly larger version came out perfect. I don't know if this is the smallest copy of the Lorax, but it's gotta be close. One of the other things we shrunk down is one of the amazing posters that we carry in our store. We released this poster in our latest video about growing neurons connected to a computer. And while you can't get the micro dot version, the full-sized version is pretty amazing. It has three modes, including white light, glow in the dark, and UV reactive. And it has one of our actual neuron arrays stuck to it. If you'd like one, either follow this QR code or go to thethoughtemporium.ca. And in the spirit of spy tech, we've hidden a code somewhere in this video that the first 100 people to use will get 5% off their order. Also, in case you missed the announcement, we recently started a newsletter. It's a mix of behind the scenes updates, cool experiments that didn't make it into videos, and some of our favorite bits of science news from that month. If you're interested, sign up below and you'll get a nice little hello from us once a month filled with science goodies. And finally, as always, I need to say a special thank you to our amazing patrons and channel members that help make these videos possible. For those interested, patrons and members get access to our exclusive Discord channel, and your support goes such a long way to keep the flow of videos coming. So if you'd like to support the videos, check out the link below. But that's all we have for this video, so thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.